Uh, well, just, just before we start, I just want to say what a pleasure it is for the three of us to be able to sit here with you. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> well, it's true, we don't usually get the chance to, to talk to you in this way. Oh, so, wow. thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I've got the first question here, so um, we're delving into your background now. So your first degree was in sociology, social anthropology, and social administration. Uh, what made you decide to go into law? Uh, long or short answer? Okay, I'll give you the medium length answer. <laughs> um, I did those subject or, subjects originally um, because I think I thought I wanted to go into some kind of social work. I was quite interested in kind of social justice issues. Thought I wanted to go into social work, and after about two weeks at university, I decided I wasn't actually interested in doing that at all, and I wasn't sure what I did want to do, although I did think that I wanted to have a career in academic research. I liked doing research right from the very beginning. After university, I went to work at the Institute of Criminology in Cambridge as a social scientist, as a quantitative social scientist, and then I got a job at the Socio-Legal Centre in Oxford doing, as a social scientist, but researching justice system issues. And the more I did about that, the more I realised that I couldn't really have a career... Do I, I, I was fascinated with all the things I was doing, but I wouldn't be able to have a career in that kind of academic research unless I did some proper law. Right. And I also felt that I, after a while of working with lawyers and other social scientists, but economists as well, I felt that I kind of moved away from my kind of sociology background and had become more sort of socio-legal, but I would never be accepted um, by lawyers unless I had a law degree. And so I did a part-time, so I was working in Oxford and I did a part-time law degree in the evenings. Okay. And um, after, some time after that, uh, in fact, almost as soon as I finished my part-time law degree, I got a job teaching law, unbelievably, teaching land law trusts and constitutional <laughs> law at Queen Mary. I always used to say that teaching trust turned me to drink. Um, <laughs> but, um, it nearly did, actually. Um, but, um, and so it, was, it wasn't sort of like my long-term game plan to do that, but it just seemed to me that if I wanted to have a career, and it wouldn't be in a social science department, uh, if I wanted to have a career in a law department, I would have to have a law degree. And I was absolutely right, because I wouldn't have been taken on for that job unless I had been able to teach those subjects. So although I was, when I was taken on at Queen Mary... I was already a published author and um, had a very strong track record in research. Nonetheless, to get a job in a law department, I had to be able to teach core law subjects, which I did. And I taught, when I went to Queen Mary, I taught land law, I think, for nearly 10 years. Okay. Yeah, and I didn't enjoy it very much, but I did do it. <laughs> Even when I was head of department, I was still initially making myself teach land law because we were short <laughs> of land law teachers. So that's the long answer or medium answer to the question. Okay, thank you. So, regarding this part of your career and your experience as dean of UCL Laws, if I could just ask what you enjoyed most about being dean? What did I jo enjoy most about being dean? I think what I enjoyed most about being dean, people always say, oh, you have so much power. You don't really have power, you have a lot of responsibility, but you do have an opportunity to kind of change things, to influence how things go. And I've enjoyed being able to... So it is the ability to be able to influence the direction of things. So, so to be able, if you've got an idea for something that might be good, um, to be able to influence, or if other people come to you with ideas, that in a sense you, you've got the, a kind of limited sense of power to make change. You have to be careful because you have to make sure that people agree with you when you want to make changes, but to help things to develop and to help the faculty to develop. And I think that sort of nine years on after I took over the deanship, um, it's, I mean, it always was a great faculty, but I don't think that it necessarily had the conditions for people to be operating at their maximum potential. And I like to feel that I've tried to help to create the conditions in which my really great colleagues can do their best possible work. And also, I like to think that it's a happy place and that it's a place that people like to come to work. Uh, I kind of felt that I wanted a really... A, a, a working environment that was kind of reasonably happy and cohesive. Um, and I think that we've got that. And I, I like the fact that students like being here and they enjoy being here and the staff enjoy coming to work. And for me, that's hugely satisfying. And you were just talking about the developments you've seen as, as dean of faculty. 
when starting out, what did you want to achieve as, as Dean of Faculty? That's such a funny question because I dodged being Dean for about 14 years. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be Dean. I did three years as head of department at Queen Mary before I came here. And when I finished those three years, I said, I will never do that again unless I absolutely have to. Because uh, I found it, I found it quite hard actually, mm -hmm. and um, I didn't choose to become dean. Um, the, the the dean that we had um, in two thousand and eight, early two thousand and eight, for various reasons, didn't work out, mm -hmm. and he very suddenly handed in his resignation. And I was on my way to an academic conference about to give a paper when I received a phone call from Malcolm Grant on my mobile phone. That's never a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I kind of said, hi, Malcolm. Anyway, um, he told me that the dean had resigned and he wanted me to take over as acting dean. And that, that's the kind of offer you can't refuse. Okay. Um, and that was fine. And I was happy to do it as acting dean, but I didn't think that I would take on the role as dean. But after I'd been acting dean for a while, I realised that actually... Um, that I, I kind of quite enjoyed it I, and I could see that there were things that would be possible to do and so I decided to stay on and if you say so I then developed ideas about what I might do as Dean and one of the most important things one of the most important fixed ideas I got very early on was that I wanted a new building for the faculty <laughs> that we, the faculty needed a new building and I think I started to agitate for a new building almost as soon as I took over as Dean. And the first set of drawings I had done were in my first year as Dean. Uh, and it took years and years and years before I could finally get approval for that building and then to get all the planning commission and all the rest of it. So that, it, it was, I didn't say I wanted to be Dean because I wanted to do that, but that was something I felt I really wanted to achieve. And if we ever get in the new building, I would be absolutely <laughs> delighted. <laughs> if we're getting close, we're just not there yet. The other thing I wanted to do, and probably my colleagues don't necessarily know this, but one of the things that was in the back of my mind, I had always what felt that a faculty like UCL should have an access to justice centre. All of my work has been about access to justice in issues, and I wanted there to be an access to justice centre here. A, to give the students the experience of how the law works in the real world, to get a feel for the power of the law to change people's lives, to give them a commitment to social justice issues and to how you can use the law to help to um, create or support social justice. Um, but I also felt that it's a good thing for a faculty to do because it's a contribution to the community. If you do pro, if students do pro bono work, it's a genuine contribution to the community. And so I had hoped that one of the things I might be able to do as Dean would be able to set up something like that. And again, and that is something that I had the power to influence um, the development of that and to see it set up and so for me that is really uh, that's a kind of personal thing right. that I'm really pleased about and um, you know I hope that that will continue to grow. Um, my next question is uh, on behalf of Tom Sirubadra who is a current UCL Law's LLM student um, and he was wondering what the most interesting project is that you've worked on as uh, the Dean of UCL Law's. This is really sad, but I think one of the most interesting projects actually is, has been the building, the new building. Interesting because it's required a massive range of skills that I did not have. <laughs> I really didn't, you know, I'm not a professional, I don't know, I can barely sort out the decoration of my own kitchen. I have. <laughs> so taking on something like that uh, has been massive. And I have learned a huge amount. So um, that has been really interesting. The other thing I suppose that's been really interesting as a dean has been working with the other deans in the institution. So you're not just dean of faculty, but you're part of the senior management team of UCL. So understanding how an institution like UCL works, and it is right. really complex. So understanding how that institution works and how it fits into the landscape of higher education, how the law faculty fits within um, the framework of UCL, but also working closely with other deans from other disciplines, um, and um, other sort of models for faculties has actually been really interesting. I've learned a huge amount. And I think it's helped um, me to encourage people, the faculty, to be more interdisciplinary, which I think it has become over the years. So lots of people in the faculty are working very closely with people from other bits of UCL. You know, a lot of the kind of global challenges that we have require interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approaches in order to do the best possible research. So I think those are, I mean, so many things I've done have been so interesting and I have and I do think it's important and I'm going to say this because I want to encourage people to take on 
kind of leadership roles, people often shrink from leadership roles. Oh, I don't want to do that. I'm going to manage things. It's difficult. And it is. It is difficult and it is challenging. But my goodness, you grow as a person. Right. You know, you grow beyond... You, you don't lose being an academic or being a teacher or committed to that. But you grow and you develop a huge range of other skills. Um, and so I think I would encourage people to do that. And I feel I've grown hugely. I've learned from my colleagues in law. I've learned from other deans. I've learned... Um, many things that I simply wouldn't have known and wouldn't have been able to do before. So the next question I have is what do you think you'll miss most about being the Dean? Uh, what will I miss? I think the things that I said that li- I like is the power to influence and to change. So you don't, I mean, people say to me, oh, my son said to me when I was talking about possibly doing another term, he said to me, you're behaving like a sort of African dictator who won't let go of power. We have to wrench power from their fingers. And, um, and, and I said, because I, I, I was thinking hard about whether I would go on and do it another term, but I think nine years is enough. Um, but, and, and you don't really have that much power, but you do have the power to influence things. And you can see, if you, if you get an idea or if people come to you with an idea and you think, yes, this would be something that's good, as dean, you can, you've got some levers to make things happen. Um, and when you're not dean, it's not that you don't have power to influence, but you have less power, you're not in the, the same kind of position. You have to start influencing other people before you can, before you can get, get things done. And I know you were just mentioning change. How do you see UCL laws changing over the coming years? Well... In some ways, I'd like it to stay very much the same, although nothing can, you know, nothing stays good if it doesn't develop and grow. Um, What I don't see, I I took someone on tour of a new building yesterday and they said, um, you know, are you going to have a massive expansion? And I said, no. And I think we've discussed this a lot in the faculty and we kind of like the size that we are. We're about the same size as Yale. And I think that that's fine. So I would like it to stay a sort of medium size faculty and I think that that's true of my colleagues as well we don't want to have massive numbers of students all, all over us because I, I just think it's it's a nice community and I think I like the community feel and I think others do as well so I think things like that will change I think the values of the faculty I hope will remain the same so the values of kind of inclusion respect for colleagues our commitment to the academic mission but also to being useful in the world and um, focusing on issues that are of relevance um, at the moment um, the way I think it will change because everything has to change it has to grow because the circumstances will change we don't know what will happen with things like Brexit we don't we don't know how that will affect um, the university we don't know how it will affect the higher education landscape we don't know how it will affect research, affect research. so I think that it will change it may well develop its um, programs of learning at the moment we're looking at the LLB we may we may modify that in the future. So there are lots of small ways in which it, I'm sure it will develop and change. Um, there are opportunities for uh, grappling with new things that are coming, like artificial intelligence and sort of law and technology, those kinds of things. But um, I hope that its kind of core values will stay the same. Um, I'm sure it will, and that it will continue to be uh, an incredibly high-quality research and teaching institution with um, a really cohesive community of scholars and students. That's my hope for the future. Exactly. Um, you've touched on this already, but uh, the next question is again about change, about uh, things about the faculty that you think it's important not to change. And you mentioned kind of the size I think and the values. Is there anything else, or would you like to expand on those at all? Um, no, I think... Oh, okay, so something else that is... Um, different about this faculty from some of the other faculty in the college is that all of our staff are um, teach as well as research so we all research but we all teach and I think that that's really important it means that our teaching is top quality informed led by our research I think it's interesting for the students but I think it's also true that we don't have distinctions between our academics so that actually we're, we're all doing the same thing that's what I said about it being sort of inclusive um, we are, I mean, all institutions are a bit hierarchical, but I don't think we're tremendously hierarchical, and I, li- and I like that. We're kind of quite a democratic faculty. So things like that, which I suppose are part of our core values and culture, I rather like. 
And I think that our approach a very much um, welcome. Is it welcome? No, I applaud the approach when we had to decide what to do about how we were to allocate offices in the new building. And we had a faculty discussion about that. And we decided that we would not do it in a hierarchical way, so we don't let the professors choose which rooms they want. And we allocated the rooms by ballot. Now, okay. actually, you think, well, okay, it's an obvious thing to do. It isn't an obvious thing to do. And the fact that, that just people just accepted that straight away, I thought was really great. So to stay on the topic of change, obviously, we will have a new dean to kind of influence the coming years of the faculty. Is there any advice you would give to him? I don't think it's a good idea to advise your successor. There's a joke that I was once told, I'm hopeless with jokes. And there's a joke, there's a joke about the, an incoming dean and three envelopes, and I can't remember what it is, but if I remember the joke, I'll tell you. Um, but uh, which is, with each envelope has advice for the, uh, the successor, but I can't remember what the joke is. Um, so that wasn't very helpful, was it? Um, but I must look that up. I was trying to remember it the other day when I was asked to do the spotlight thing, and I could not remember the joke, except that it was funny. <laughs> so don't ever it's quite funny not remembering it. No, <laughs> I can never remember jokes. Uh, and I, never, I try generally not to tell them. So my advice to him would be to um, be his own person, which I think he is. Um, don't do anything too dramatic <laughs> immediately. Um, but be his own person. But the, the, the other thing, is, I think, is what I said before, is that you know I think the faculty is doing brilliantly, and I am really pleased. We've got great people. The faculty is doing really well. But you have to keep working at it for it to get like that. So you have to you have to continue to develop, to change, to grow in order even to just stay at the level that you are. And um, you know the world is highly competitive. We are going to be facing challenges. So one just has to kind of keep thinking about how we develop to meet those challenges, bearing in mind always the kind of guiding kind of values and principles of the faculty. So I don't have very specific advice. I don't think he'd welcome it, actually. <laughs> I think let him get on and do, do the job, which I'm sure he'll do brilliantly. Moving away a little bit from you know, your office as, as a dean and, of course, the future dean, what are your plans for the future? Really busy. And um, I was thinking that, um, I was looking at my diary and I was thinking, how is my autumn filling up so much? And I think if you've always been a, a busy person, I was very busy before I was dean and um, I'm, I will be very busy afterwards. The main things I want to do is to catch up on my research. So I've got some half done research projects that I have not been able to finish. And a big um, project for me is researching the health justice partnership that we've set up in a health centre in Stratford. So the Centre for Access to Justice does various pro bono, has various pro bono programmes, but we have set up a student legal advice clinic in a health centre in Stratford, working in partnership with a GP practice there. And the idea of this is, um, I mean, from work on um, social determinants of health and also the kind of research that I've done on how citizens deal with legal problems, and how legal problems impact health. We know that a lot of people who go to see their GP complaining about health difficulties, or the, the health difficulties they complain about, may well have some kind of soci social or soci socio-legal cause underlying it. So typical example, child goes to the doctor, child is taking the doctor repeatedly with asthma, but actually what's underlying the asthma is the fact that they're living in poor housing conditions with a lot of damp. And yes, you can give them puffers and all the rest of it, but what they need is to get rehoused. Yeah. And no matter how many times you go to the GP, that's not going to solve that problem. And for us, the idea that the GP can say, go and see the clinic downstairs, I think that they might be able to help you. And this is a specific kind of case that we've dealt with, um, is absolutely amazing. And at a common sense level, you can say, well, it's obvious that in those kinds of situations, access to early legal advice in the same physical location as a health practice must be good both for the patients in terms of helping to improve their health if we can solve that legal problem, but also it's good for the, the GPs because it gives them something to do, you know, they've got somewhere to send the patient that will help them. So although at a common sense level we can say, oh, that's obvious, actually, yeah, you know, it's a no-brainer. But can you demonstrate that providing 
that kind of legal advice actually does deliver um, a health benefit? Can you can you can you demonstrate a causal link between the advice and the health benefit or the the benefit to the health service? Being able to do that, which you need to do in order to get kind of policy commitment to developing those kinds of partnerships and even investment in those kinds of partnerships. So you need to be able to find to provide evidence. And what I'm trying to do is to collect data down in Stratford that would begin the process of creating the evidence base for um, developing, for having a more kind of coordinated policy approach to those kinds of health justice partnerships. And that is a big project. It's, a, it's very difficult to do. I'm only at the early stages of being funded by the Legal Education Foundation to do that. Um, I'm planning a big... Um, it's not a big, well, big-ish workshop in November with health policy people and Malcolm Grant, the NHS, um, to try and talk through some of those issues and to think about how we do create an evidence base. But So that's going to keep me quite busy. Sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got one or two other projects that I need to finish up, but I won't bore you with that. So uh, I, am, I, w- I will be busy, with mainly with research in the autumn, which will be lovely after really not having had much time you know, all the stuff I've done recently has been on aeroplanes on the way to give, you know, I've gone somewhere across the world to give a big lecture and I've been writing it on the aeroplane because I'm time to do it beforehand. Wow. It's usually quite pleased if I manage to get it written on the aeroplane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, just to talk a bit more about the UCL Centre for Access to Justice, you're yeah. the director of that uh, centre. Uh, could you tell us a bit about what was the driving force behind its creation? Um, Dire, it's a, for me, it's it's a kind of direct response to the research that I've done over years on unmet legal need. So if you, the kind of research that I've done has been talking to citizens about problems that they have faced that are justiciable problems, so problems that, for which a legal remedy exists, and trying to see what they do about them. So if you're faced with a housing problem, if you're faced with um, a welfare benefits issue, if you're faced with an employment problem, a family problem, immigration problem, any of those things, what do you do? What do ordinary people do? And the answer is they often don't know what to do. Now, in the days when we used to have legal aid, Mm -hmm. uh, they might be able to go to a CAB or some other sorts of free legal advice. Obviously, if they can afford to go to a solicitor, they might go to a solicitor. But um, if you can't afford to do that, how do you seek some kind of legal, the, the kind of legal redress that exists to help you to enforce your rights or to compel another person to comply with their obligations? What do you do? And um, a lot of people don't know what to do. And even if they do know what to do, they can't access free sources of legal advice. Uh, that's got worse since um, the coalition government in 2012 passed um, uh, an act which effectively removed all remaining legal aid from civil justice problems. So most legal aid is spent on um, criminal legal aid and to some extent some kind of human rights issues. Um, and so in a climate where there is a lack of free advice for citizens facing everyday legal problems, not big heroic things that hit the newspapers, but the kinds of legal problems that blight the lives of people. So as I said, things to do with not being able to get your benefits, not being able to get appropriate housing, having trouble at work, not being able to sort out an immigration situation. These are the kinds of everyday things that actually make life miserable for people and will affect their health. Um, and lots of law schools in this country and around the world have pro bono schemes whereby the students actually provide some legal advice with, with uh, supervision. And UCL, when I took over as dean, UCL did not have one of those. And um, we'd had sort of little bits of things in the past, but we, we didn't have that kind of access to justice centre. And so what I wanted to do was to set up a centre, and I I think I said this before, where students would be able to provide advice to citizens facing legal problems that would help the students to understand how law works in the real world, to help them understand how for some people the law is all they have if they are trying to change a difficult situation for themselves. That's that's all they've got, they've got nothing else. Um, And how providing people with information, with advice and with representation, advocacy, you can have a transformative effect on their life. 
And giving students that kind of experience, and this is not about giving students you know, the skills for legal practice. You, know, you, you do develop skills about that. It's giving them an understanding of the power of the law, helping them to understand the realities of lack of access to justice. And actually, I hope, instilling in them a commitment to social justice questions. And so that, so the Access to Justice Centre comes, A, from my commitment, A, to social justice principles, but also, secondly, it flows out of the research that I've done, which demonstrated and quantified the extent to which ordinary people facing quite boring, but really awful legal problems um, needed help in sorting those things out. And I think that um, law schools have a tremendous potential to make a contribution to access to justice. I don't think that we should be doing the job of government, we shouldn't be filling the gaps of legal aid, but the reality is that I don't see legal, coming, legal aid coming back in any form that we recognise um, in even the, the distant future. And, and actually, I think, it's, I think it's a good thing for students to be doing that. So if I, if I was going to be dean forever, my ambition would be that all students uh, studying in UCL have the opportunity, I wouldn't say the obligation, because I don't think you should make people do this, but all students have the opportunity to engage in this kind of access to justice pro bono work. Yeah. That was a very long answer to that mm-hmm. question, I'm sorry about that. So just on the topic, uh, you've kind of touched on this already, but you've written widely over the years on public access to the justice system and the centre shows a sort of continued commitment and passion for that throughout your deanship. But my question is how you think recent political developments will affect that that access to the justice system? Well, I think uh, the situation is pretty dire. So I think that... Um, As far as the criminal justice system is concerned, um, we still do have legal aid for criminal cases. If you're faced with a criminal offence, even that's getting quite tough. But in areas, you know, the whole area of social welfare law, private family law, um, all of these kinds of areas, we have no effective legal aid. And the the effect of that is that um, you don't have private solicitors who can provide those kinds of legal aid services, but also... A lot of the um, advice centres, free advice centres, have had to contract their activities, make people redundant, even some of them have closed down. So there are actually fewer sources of free legal advice than there used to be in the past. And so I think access to justice uh, is more difficult um, than it was, and it's certainly more difficult since 2012. And I do not see it getting any better in the foreseeable future. I mean, we are facing considerable strains on the economy as a result of Brexit. I think that's going to get worse. I don't think it's going to get better. Um, you know, people complain about austerity. Uh, I think even if a Labour government were elected, I do not see them putting back in place um, a comprehensive legal aid system. I just don't think uh, I don't think the money is there to do that. And I'm not sure that the will is there to do that. I, I, I don't remember... Actually, I'm not going to get political on this. But anyway, so I don't think... Wh- wh- whichever government is in power... I do not think that the legal aid system, as we once knew it, will come back. Um, I think that there are little things that the Ministry of Justice are trying to do to try to provide some support for litigants in person. Um, but I, I think um, it will it will be uh, as difficult as it has been in the past. And even if we move to online courts, which is another area that I'm very interested in, if we move to online courts and more simplified procedures. We still have some of the most vulnerable groups, some of the most disadvantaged groups will struggle with using those kinds of systems. They require levels of literacy, uh, you know, computer, ordinary literacy, computer literacy, access, all of those kinds of things. So I think that there will be hard-to-help groups who um, will continue to struggle in the future to have any kind of access to justice. And um, I think, as I said, that law schools do provide... Are, can provide um, some kind of resource in that respect. And I hope that UCL will continue to um, contribute to at least mitigating some of the lack of access to justice. It can't do more than that, but a little bit. And provide a, a benefit for local communities. And you've also been speaking about the involvement of students in Proberno and helping um, 
helping people access justice more generally. Um, and I have a question here on behalf of Godwin Pangalam, he's a UCL Law alumni from 2017, and he's wondering um, whether you have any advice for the next generation of lawyers when it comes to promoting civil justice. The next generation was for promoting civil justice. Well, first, first of all, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> think about what I mean. Civil justice is a, is a difficult concept because people don't really know what you mean. Civil justice covers pretty much everything that isn't um, criminal justice. Um, so you've got civil justice, civil commercial, family, administrative um, justice. So I, I, I would encourage people to think about it and think about the importance of civil justice issues to the lives of most people. Most people's lives will be more, are more likely to be touched by civil justice questions than criminal law questions. Uh, people don't realise that there are many more cases going through the civil courts and tribunals than there are going through the criminal courts. And yet people find it difficult to talk about civil justice because it's such a, there's so many different things that go into it. Um, so I would say to um, the next generation of lawyers, think about it, think about um, the benefit of contributing to uh, work on civil justice and even if you are going to go into a commercial law practice as a barrister or a solicitor and lots of our students do do those kinds of things you can still do pro bono work lots of people do um, so e even if you're in commercial practice think about ways in which you can contribute to access to justice issues through pro bono activities su supporting pro bono activities I want to shift gears a little bit and talk a bit more about you and your career. Um, so you've held quite a, quite a number of high profile positions in your career, including but not limited to uh, being the Dean. Um, we're wondering, have you enjoyed the kind of public aspect of these roles? Or do you sometimes wish that you'd chosen a career path that put you a little less in the spotlight and give you a little more solitude or privacy? That's a really interesting question, and I thought about it quite hard, and uh, the fact of the matter is that you are what you do in the end, and those are choices, all of those roles, nobody forced them on me, I chose them, and if you chose them, then that's because that's what you want to do, right. and so there would be plenty of opportunities when I would be sort of moaning and say, oh, I've got so much to do, and <laughs> there's all of this, uh, but the fact of the matter is that that's what I chose, and that's what I enjoy, and I get, I derived a huge amount of interest and pleasure from many of those roles. One of the hardest um, roles, one of the roles that I found most challenging was on the Judicial Appointments Commission, um, which actually required really hard thinking about policy questions and about evidence and appointments and how to influence diversity, how to increase diversity. Really hard questions. Um, and I found that absolutely fascinating and a lot of that was actually quite difficult and quite challenging. Um, but in the end, even though things are hard, if you get intellectual satisfaction from it and personal satisfaction from it, um, it's fantastic. And so all of those public service roles, um, I gave a lot of time to, and, and I did it because I enjoyed it. And, I, and you learn from those things. You learn, you grow, you learn about the world, you just become um, a more knowledgeable person. And I... I like learning about things. I suppose I'm just this endless researcher <laughs> learning about things I didn't know about. But you can always use that knowledge, that additional knowledge, in your core job. You can bring that to bear. So it makes you a more interesting person. It makes you think about things differently um, because you've been operating in a different field. So if you're working with politicians, if you're working with civil servants, if you're seeing how policy is made, it helps you understand the world a bit better. Uh, informs your research, helps you to ask more interesting research questions. Um, on the question about would I have liked a bit more solitude, there were plenty of times, I don't, I don't think solitude is it, where I, I don't think where I craved solitude, but there are sometimes looking back when I think I haven't had a particularly good work-life balance, when I think I've been working more than I should have done and perhaps giving more time to things like public service roles that on reflection I think, well, you know, could I have done things slightly differently? You, you, yeah, and I probably could have done, probably my kids might say I could have done this work. <laughs> but I think the main thing, um, as an opportunity for reflection, and I kind of think, how did I do all of those things and actually manage to have a reasonable life? 
Um, and the answer is that um, probably for most of my life, since you know I've been at work and I've had kids, I basically had work and family, and what I sacrificed was social life. Right. So I haven't really so there wasn't space for social life. Right. That's okay. Mm. It's, yeah. a cho- it's a choice you make. Yeah, of course. So you mentioned the uh, Judicial Appointments Committee and my question is why it was important for you to hold positions such as that and serving on the, uh, the Civil Justice Council alongside your academic career? Um, two, th- two, uh, two things at least. First of all, um, because they are intrinsically fascinating roles because you are centrally engaged in the formulation and implementation of policy, uh, which is fascinating. And secondly, because I, I said I've always been a researcher. I am a researcher at heart. I'm an empirical researcher at heart, so I want to know how do things work, and I need to understand that through the collection of data, through the observation of how things work. Um, but the research questions I have, um, I'm a very practical person, and the research questions I have are always very, very directly related to policy issues. So it doesn't mean that there aren't sort of broader theoretical questions that they can answer, but that the research addresses policy questions and if you're interested in policy if you're interested in influencing policy then as a researcher being asked to do those kinds of roles because of the work that you've done gives you it gives you the opportunity to influence policy in a very direct way so you can do research and write about it and hope that people will hope that policy people will read your research and that it will influence them but the best way of influencing policy is to get yourself onto the committees that are creating the policy, developing the policy, and you're influencing right at the heart of the policy making process. And for me, that has always been a major fascination. In, in a sense, it's the ultimate um, outcome of doing research. So you do the research, you're interested to find out what the answers are, um, and then to influence policy in a way that you think will benefit. And it's, it's not about benefiting, it, it's about creating a benefit for society in the, to the extent that something, and in my case the justice system, might work a bit better in the interests of the public, because that's ultimately what my interest is. I next I have a question that's more in relation to sort of women in law and women as academics. And um, it's said that many successful bright academics identify as suffering from some sort of imposter syndrome and this is uh, considered more common in men, uh, so in women than in men. Mm. Have you experienced imposter syndrome in your life, and how? And, and if so, how did you deal with it? Um, I think earlier in my career, I don't know whether I would call it imposter sy- syndrome, uh, but earlier in my career, um, I think where I lacked the kind of confidence that I had now, you get to a point where you're so old and experienced that you, that you worry less about it. Um, but um, I think that I have always felt that the way to gain respect, both from men and women, from anybody, is through competence. We don't talk enough about competence, actually. We talk about confidence, we don't talk about comf- competence. And so if I've ever been given a, co- a task or I take it on, I always kind of want to do it as well as I possibly can. Maybe that's a kind of personality thing. Um, but thinking about committees that I went on sort of much earlier in my career um, where and much earlier in my career I was working almost exclusively in male environments so I would get a pointed thing where I was the only woman there and in the early days I'll never forget this I went, I was the first time I was appointed to the SRC grants board and the first meeting I went to I was the first person in the room and a man walked in and said to me and where's the tea he hadn't seen me before and he assumed I was, you know, that somebody there to provide the tea. And I said, I really have not the faintest idea. I don't know. It's my first time here. But I kind of accepted that. But so that you, I think for a woman, you may have to work a bit harder to gain respect. You have to gain respect. You don't get it automatically. How do you gain respect when you're working with academics, when you're working with judges, when you're working with professionals? Uh, and the answer, I believe, is through... Com- being as competent as you can, that means that you read whatever the papers are, that you are informed about the thing that you're doing. You don't kind of blunder into the room and try and wing it, because I never did trust myself to do that. Um, and, uh, and that's the way, and then gradually you acquire it, or you earn respect through competence. And I've always tried to do that. I still do it now. I mean, I won't 
I sometimes blunder into rooms that I haven't read the papers, but mostly I will have read them because I want to be on top of the material. If I'm going to make a con, if I'm going to open my mouth in a meeting to say something, I want to feel that you know that at least I know roughly what I'm talking about. And um, and it, you know, people say that women are less likely to kind of wing it or blag their way through things, and I think to some extent that's true. Um, anyway, that's. Mm. I don't know if that, if that answers the question about imposter syndrome, but um, certainly I th- I, I've always felt it's important to demonstrate competence as far as I possibly can. To sort of stay a bit on that topic, um, we're wondering if kind of throughout your career you feel that you've had kind of additional expectations or assumptions or constraints of some kind imposed on you that were not necessarily imposed on men in similar positions to yours? Oh, um, I think inevitably um, that there are different... And, and that's changed over time. I mean, I've, you know, my career's been quite long. And, I mean, the most obvious example was, is... It doesn't happen now, but years ago, when you would turn up at a building and um, you would... Say, and the, the, the person on the desk couldn't find your name because they're looking for, for a professor and you can't be the professor. I, I, I can't remember how it worked, but it, you know, the people could never find you on the list. And oh, I'd say Hazel Gen, and they, but they'd be looking and they see professor, so they, they would think it couldn't be me kind of right. thing. So there were those kind of sort of rather simple kind of stereotyped um, things. Um, of course, there may be things that I don't know about, that um, uh, there may be opportunities that I missed that I wouldn't know about because I was right. because people were only thinking about men and they weren't thinking about me. I would say that um, in towards the middle of my career, I felt that there were opportunities that came to me specifically because I was a woman, mm-hmm. because um, I was operating in a very male environment, and as um, boards, as committees, as things started to feel that they had to be more diverse, and people sit around think. God, is there not a woman out there, somebody that we can get on this committee? It's like, I know, Hazel, let's get Hazel. And so there was sometimes I would, turn, I would think, why have I been asked on this committee? I think it's because they need a woman. Right. Um, but then, but I don't mind. I don't have a massive ego about things like that. I'm very objective focused. So if it's something that I wanted to do and it was interesting, you know, that's fine. And if I was asked on because they were trying to think of a woman and they came up with my name, that's fine. And, um, you know, I'll do a good job. Great. And for the final question, this is it's a slight change, but I was just wondering if you had anything that you would like to say to the students at UCL. What would I like to say? To th- I'm, what I would like to say to the students at UCL is that I actually have missed um, close connection with UCL because as uh, close connection with the students because as dean, because you're always so busy and you're always in meetings that I haven't been able to kind of do it because I haven't been teaching. The students regularly. I don't feel that I've had the kind of contact that I used to have, and that is actually something that I miss because I think the students that we have at UCL are absolutely fantastic, top, top, top quality students, really interesting. And on the occasions that I come into contact with them, when we're doing mooting or if I go to reception or something, I'm, I'm always reminded about actually how much I miss um, missing them. So that's just that's a personal thing for me. Um, my advice to the students is to t- really take advantage of the opportunities of studying at UCL but also being in London and please try and panic less uh, try <laughs> you know I do feel that students nowadays feel tremendously stressed I mean I think it is a highly com- it's a much more competitive world than it used to be um, I, and I, I think that we have very highly motivated students but you are you are here because you are really good and you will do well because you are really good and you need to kind of have more faith in yourselves and um, allow yourself the opportunity to kind of take all the advantages of not just doing the work but actually doing all the other things that there are and um, don't worry so much if you possibly can uh, because you will do well because most of our students really do do well because you are really good. And so I hate it when I see students kind of incredibly stressed out by, um, by things. And um, I would encourage all students who haven't, been, who haven't had the opportunity to be in the new building <laughs> to come back uh, when, when we finally get in there, to come back when we have our opening events and kind of enjoy it and be part of, be part of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.